All right, let me say good evening to my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a joy to be with you again as we engage ourselves in the study of the Word of God. And we are embarking on another journey. This is a seven-week journey now. And I believe that we are in for a really good time as we study the Word of God together. I just want to say thanks to Reverend Curry for taking the initiative to have this Bible study for all the churches combined. Um, and for giving me the opportunity to be the presenter of this study, which I believe can make a significant difference in the, in the life of the Church of God Reformation Movement here in Barbados. So I wanted us to take this study very, very seriously and that we are engaged um, actively in it and that we make sure we encourage as many people as possible to be part of this study. The last one which was facilitated by Sauter's. We did not see as many people online as we hope to see, but I believe that since this is a national study, we should take it seriously. And if we really want to be stronger together, we should really um, engage ourselves in great detail in this study. I want to say thanks to Reverend Jefferson, um, Aline again for being the host, and Fabian as well, who would have prepared the slides with the material that we're going to be using, who has made himself available um, to manage our Zoom platform for us. We appreciate that and we thank you very much. So before we actually get engaged in our study, Fabian is going to play a song for us. And we promise that each of the sessions that we begin, we will start with a song that connects us, you know, to the whole concept or theme of unity, because that's what our focus is, stronger together as one. So we, we are going to be dealing in depth with the whole concept of unity. So we're going to let Brother Fabian play that song for us as we meditate together, and then we will go into our actual study. Thank you. Make us one voice, make us one mind, make us one. Thank you very much, Brother Fabian. And that should have given some more people the opportunity to get on the platform so that you can be with us in, in, our, in our study. Monday night, I witnessed an incident which reminded us of the power of unity. This was a football game that was being played and was being televised. And in that, we saw a young man made a tackle on another player and he received a serious injury which caused his heart to stop. He went into cardiac arrest. He lay flat on the playing field, motionless. And the medical team had to come out to try to resuscitate him. And then he had to be rushed off to the hospital in serious condition. The game stopped. And we saw thousands of people all across the stadium praying. We saw players holding hands and crying, hugging each other and praying as well. These were players of opposing teams who had been in competition that night against each other. But now they, they come together as one because a player was injured, seriously injured. And people came together in oneness because there was a focus now on that young man being revived and not, not suffering death as a result of the injury. And this was a clear indication of the power of unity. Teams that would have been opposing to each other, people there perhaps from different backgrounds, different persuasions, different belief systems, whatever, were united and join heart to pray for a young man whose life was on the line. And that was a focus that brought them together. So we're reminded that unity needs a focus. There must be something that brings us together and unites us. 
and we're going to pay a lot of attention to that as we go through this study. That young man has started a fund to help underprivileged children get some toys. He started this GoFundMe um, account, I think sometime in, in 2020. And up to that point, the fund had only raised about $2,900. But because of the, of the power of what happened that night and people joining together with the focus on, on that young man being revived, it was realized that in a matter of hours, that fund moved to $4.4 million. People coming together and rallying around him and the cause um, for which he was playing. That shows the power of unity. Unity is very, very important to the life of the church and our mission. And I really believe it, it has great potential to propel our church forward in significant ways. We get a full understanding of the power there is when we are combined, when we are focused, when we are rallying around a cause. It is so important that Jesus, while well, he was about to go to the cross, I believe feeling the agony that he would have to endure, took the time to pray. And this is in John chapter 17, and focus on the unity of the brotherhood, the unity of the disciples, and praying that they would be one as he and the Father are one. And this shows how significant the, the issue of unity was to Jesus that at that point in his life and what he was facing that was ahead, his focus was on the unity of the church. This again tells us how significant this is, the heart of Christ. And so it must be significant to us. So as we go through this study, we see the, the importance of this and why it is it's so necessary that we come together as, as one community of believers, the Church of God Reformation Movement here in Barbados, and realize the power and the potential that, that we have and what we can accomplish when we are really indeed working together. Now, there's some things I want to establish, you know, that we are going to operate by some principles so that, you know, we are clear on how we are proceeding. Now, we're going to focus a lot on our movement as a, as a community of believers. So we're not going to be focusing in any large measure on, on unity from an international perspective or a global perspective. We, we are focusing more on what we need to do as a, as a local church as, as a, a, a assembly of believers here to bring ourselves together in a stronger way. But of course, this will spill over to any persons who are on, online from other groups um, to see the significance of unity and how it can be enhanced in the life of the church. So I want us to recognize, first of all, that this is a study and not a lecture. So I am hoping that everybody will be engaged. Your, your opinion your perspective is important because that's how we're going to learn from each other and that's how we're going to get the best out of the study. This is how we're going to discover um, the truth and we're going to get an understanding of God's perspective as we dialogue together as brothers and sisters who are united in the spirit and that's what we are aiming at because it's the truth that really binds us together, the truth of the word of God. And while we would have, of course, our opinions and our um perhaps ideas and perspectives, we want to make sure that the foundation of what we are going to be engaged in is going to be the basis of the word of God. It's what God says in his word, what God's perspective on the whole issue is that we are going to be discussing. I want you also to, to bear in mind that we are going to be focusing, as I said, on our local assembly, on our general assembly. And so there are things that are going to intimately connect um, to these groups. But what I want you to do is try not to be, to be negative in relation to things that are specifically related to your church or even our assembly. But we focus on things that are positive and where we have things that we can highlight about our local church or the assembly that we believe are heading us in the right direction. We want to encourage those things. 
if there are things that you have issues with, of course, you can take those up at another um, type of meeting of a different forum where you can discuss those things that you might have issues with. But um, during these sessions, we want to be focused on, on looking at things that will, will benefit us and that will help us in positive ways. And so we want you to keep that in mind. So what I want to do as we go into our study is to give you an idea of our objectives, because it's important that we know where we are heading and then we can evaluate if we have arrived there because we have objectives which we hope to achieve. So I'm going to go through them pretty quickly and then we're going to, to enter into what our dialogue and discussion is going to focus on tonight. So the general objective here is that the members of the Church of God Reformation Movement in Barbados become more unified, more Christ-like, more spirit-directed, and more productive at the local and national level as a result of our Bible study on the team, Stronger Together. All right, so that's the general focus. Specific objectives here are aimed in two categories, to improve our knowledge and understanding of the concept, and also to bring about a change in our whole attitude. That's the effect, the effective aspect of it, right? You have the cognitive and we have the effective. These are the two main domains that we are going to be focusing on. And, and this is very, very important that we understand that we are not just looking to have intellectual discussion. But at the end of it all, we want to change in behavior. Positive things that we can do and changes that we might necessarily have to make in our own lives, in our own relationships, to make us stronger together as a body. So I have six specific objectives to identify. Then I'm going to give you a brief outline of the content of the study. And then we're going to proceed to have a general understanding of what unity is all about. So we're going to define the theme. We're going to look at some statements made about unity and some perspectives on the whole concept. And obviously they're, they're not all ideas coming directly from me. There's some of um, the ideas will come from people making statements about unity from the research I have done. So I want you to listen carefully to them. You can in, engage in dialogue because you might have perhaps some disagreement with some of the statements that are made. Now, I want you to make sure that where you see things that you can agree with and that you feel strongly about, that you make that clear so that we get a general understanding of things that you are comfortable with and maybe also things that you're uncomfortable with. Let that be known because we, we want to, to, to get to the heart of the matter we want to be clear in our minds how we feel about particular issues. So don't hesitate to, to say if you have a, a particular um, disagreement with a statement that has been made or perspective on the, the concept. But of course, if you have an agreement, there's something that they say that you think is a positive point, make sure that that is clear as well so that we know precisely how you're thinking. All right, so here are six objectives to improve in our understanding of the biblical perspective of Christian unity. And I'm going to use the term improve in our understanding because we were taught this in our training um, in teachers college that never assume that your students or the people that you're dealing with don't know anything about the topic that you're presenting. So that's why it is always um, important to say improve in your understanding. So it means that you recognize that people have some understanding. I know a lot of you are, are persons who would have perhaps done research on a topic and you are very familiar with some of the things that we're going to be discussing. So I, I recognize that you are going to have um, understanding. So we're looking at improving our understanding. To better understand what unity is and what it is not, you have to have a clear indication of what the team actually means. To better understand what causes this unity in the church. To improve in our ability to deal with this unity when it is evident in the church. To identify and commit ourselves to Christian attributes which foster unity among members. This is the effective part here coming in out. And then to identify and commit ourselves to practical ways of maintaining unity in our fellowships and enhancing togetherness in our national body. So those are some specific um, objectives which we hope to achieve, we're hoping to achieve in our study. Now, your content outline obviously has to be based on your objectives so that these things that we're actually studying and engaged in and research from the Bible and in our, our dialogue will, will have to be focusing on achieving these things. 
So we are going to look tonight, first of all, as I said, trying to understand the concept and getting a, a, a deep understanding of what is involved in this whole idea of unity. In the second session, we will look at the historical perspective, which is entitled From Oneness to Division. We're going to, going to look back um, at how this unity occurred in the church. Then we basically started from a position that we have in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, when thousands of Christians were converted and the church established itself in Jerusalem. And there was a, it was a unified body. We're going to look at that in a little more detail in the course of our study. But over time, issues started to be created within the life of the church that caused division and caused issues to, to bring us to the point that we are today with a church with so many different denominations where we started as one unit, one family, one body in Christ. But now according to Pew Research, which is an organization that carries out research in a lot of things connected to, to Christianity. They say that there are over 3,000 um, institutional divisions um, in, the, in the life of the church. So, so Christians are a divided group, with all different types of denominations, and all different types of subsets and groups. And when you compare this with Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, you don't find that. So the big question is how have we gotten here? What are some of the issues that were created in the, in the life of the church subsequent to the, to the beginning stage that brought us to this point? And it really is a serious problem for us. It affects our whole witness, affects the whole ministry of the church, and, and it causes issues for people who are looking for truth and looking for um, a, a, a roadmap to follow. And, and their issue is, who do you really believe? Who have the truth? When you've got Nazarenes and Bezzi and Holiness and Church of God and Presbyterian and, and, and the, the whole realm of, of divisions, denominational divisions, which was never the intent of the church. And I believe that Jesus looking down the road would have seen what sort of issues would result. And that's why it was so dear to his heart to be praying for unity. So that is what we, we will be looking back at and getting a, a general perspective of what happened in the life of the church that brought us there. We're going to look at the advantage of Christian unity. We're going to look at the causes of disunity in the church and how we deal with it when it occurs. That was one of the objectives. And so we're going to look at that um, in, in terms of biblical content. Practical ways of enhancing and maintaining unity in the church. And there's a lot spoken in the Bible about these issues. So we are going to be in depth study. So I hope you have brought along your Bibles with you that you can underline a lot of the passages. Of course, Fabian will, will be pulling up some of the Bible verses that we're going to be referencing. But we will need, of course, to have our Bibles that we can underline things and go back to them. Then we're going to look at the Christian character that is necessary for unity as identified in the, in the Word. There's a character that has to come from each of us as believers to foster the type of unity which we refer to as biblical unity. We're going to look at some examples of unity demonstrated in the Bible. And then as our final session, we're going to look at the way forward. And this will be behavioral changes which can result in a more effective function in our movement. So this is going to be the, the practical application now of all that we have discussed, all that we have researched, all that we have studied from the word, all the spirit has led us into. We want to make a specific commitment. And I, I have that will come at the end of the session, which we can, you know, discuss. Um, a Stronger Together Covenant, which identifies some of the values that we need to appropriate in our own lives and agree to. And it's not a covenant that we'd be asking anybody to sign, but that, that you would agree in your heart to be able to commit yourselves to because this is necessary. And it has been pointed out in, in some of the research that is really critical that a, a, a group, a community of believers have an understanding of what values will bind them together and what they have to commit themselves to. And I, I also have identified some fundamental um, non-negotiable beliefs, which I, which I think are very pertinent um, to our understanding of the truth of what God wants us to stand by and what God wants us to be united around. And I believe that these are 
also things that we could look at. They, they have been taken um, from the, the website of the, the, the Church of God in Anderson, which is our, our, our national body. And I have sort of summarized some of, of those concepts because, you know, the, the information they had was pretty extensive and pretty long. So some of those things that we would want to be clear that we are agreed on and that they are fundamental to our faith and our belief system, um, that we have a clear understanding of those because those are things that have to bind us together and that we as the children of God have to be united around. Right, so that's a, a general idea of, of, of what we are looking at. I don't know if all your objectives are, are exhaustive and maybe somebody content. So of course, if you think there are other things that we could focus on, um, I would also want you to, to recommend. And, and if we have time, we have perhaps more topics identified than the number of weeks we have. But I want to assure you that some of these are going to be combined because each session does not perhaps have the same length of dialogue and discussion. And so we will be able to get through um, the material that we have in the time that is allocated um, to us. So I just want you to be to feel free, you know, to, to make your input because this is just not about me. I'm the presenter, but I'm not the only person that has all the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding of what we're dealing with. I recognize that, that you do too. And we are stronger together we put our ideas together. All right, so what I would do as well is at certain points, I will break for dialogue and allow you to make your input. Our sessions are one and a half hour sessions. So we are at just after eight o'clock now. So we have another um, hour to go. We are going to finish promptly at nine o'clock unless there's a really, really touching issue that we might want to go a little further, but we want to try as much as possible the key to finishing at nine o'clock. All right, so unity de is defined as the state of being one or oneness. It's the whole or a totality as combining all its parts into one. It's the state or fact of being united or combined into one as parts of a whole. And this is sort of brought out in the Corinthians passage where we have the, 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 the Christian church described as a body with many parts, but combined as one. Unity in the church is not accomplished through compromise, but by a joint effort of members of the body of Christ to walk in obedience to the truth of God's word. And Jesus prayed that we would be sanctified by the truth. He said this in John 17 while he was praying for unity. He says, Father, sanctify them by your truth because your word is truth. So the, so the binding agent around bringing us together and making us stronger is being unified around the truth of God's word. So we're looking at God's perspective, the Bible's perspective, what the word of God says about what we are going to be discussing because that is what should unite us. Because when we look back, we'll see that division came as a result of differences in theological perspective and position that were really not in accordance with the word of God. So unity is, is very, very significant. And we want to make sure that we understand that we are talking about unity from a biblical perspective. Because people can come together for different reasons and with a different focus, with a different motivation, as we said, that unity must have a focus. It must have something that brings people together. It must be something that connects people. Now, that connection is not always good. So people can come together. So even though we, we, we hear the concept of unity, John Piper says that there's good unity and there's bad unity. A unity that does not have God as the source and the focus and bring people together around things that are righteous and positive can have a, a bad effect. Because you get people in, in, in Muslim circles coming together and being unified around things that are destructive and causing serious issues for the world. They're unified around that. We have um, a lot of organizations are unified around different purposes. We have 
uh, political organizations that are unified around things that could create issues for the people that they, they are, are supposed to be looking after. And we have different um, groups and organizations who have a particular focus that unites them, but it may not necessarily be a focus that, that will be supported by the word of God. We have the LGBTQ, which is a movement um, with an agenda that brings a whole set of people from that movement together and they are unified around a cause. There is a cause. They have what they believe is a relevant cause. But is, is that cause in accordance with the word of God and with God perspective? And it's so important that we understand that we have to be unified around the truth because there's, there are a lot of things that are out there that people are united around, but there are things that could cause serious issues. And when you go to the book of Genesis, you will see that in the Tower of Babel, there were people that were unified, so unified, so knit together that God had to come down and separate those people because they were unified around the cause. But that cause was, was not in accordance with the will and purpose of God for those people. And God ended up dividing them, scattering them because they were united around the cause that would have caused real serious issues. So not every um, unified effort is necessary for a good cause. So our focus is on unity from the biblical perspective. What it is that brings us together as the people of God and brings us to a place that we bring glory and honor to God. So let's look at some statements here about unity and I'll read a couple of them and then I will pause and give you some opportunity that you know you, you can reflect on them and you can make comments on them. You can say if you agree or you disagree or if you have issues with some of the statements that are made. But these are, are, are things that have been put together to help us to understand what we're dealing with when we're talking about biblical unity or, or Christian unity. I take one here from the Church of God, Reformation Movement Anderson, and this is how they think about unity. We are people uniquely called by God to be a catalyst for Christian unity. We are called by God to be a catalyst for Christian unity. Believing that the division of the body of Christ is hell's greatest weapon to thwart heaven's ends in this world. This unity is the devil's agenda. And that's this unity of, of Christians, of, of the brotherhood of believers. We are convinced that the splintering of the body is not the Lord's work, but the enemy's. We believe that hell trembles at the prospect of a people united, redeemed by the blood, and possessed by the spirit. That's Anderson, that's our headquarters. And that's what is, is there in their website. And, and that's their statement on unity and how they see it. It's important in the life of the church and we must take it very seriously. A few quotes here. Um, one is from an unknown writer and he says, when spiders unite, they can tie down a lion. Think about that. That is speaking about the power of unity. When, when spiders unite, they can tie down a lion. Now, you might not think that that is, is might be practically so, but you get the idea of what he's trying to project here from the power of unity. Even the weak become strong when they are united. Upon the conduct of each depends the fate of all. This came from Alexander the Great. Even the weak become strong when they are united. And, and this is the idea, again, that was expressed in the first quote there, that when spiders unite, they can tie down a line. Even the weak become strong when they're united. And upon the conduct of each depends the fate of all. We are in this together. We rise together and we fall together. And, and once we are in a bond, and a, and, a un, and a united bond, this is how we have to perceive how we function. So it means that we think seriously about how we act because if we do things positively, we are going to rise together. And if we do things that are negatively impacting on our togetherness, we are going to fall together. So our fate depends on how united we are. One African proverb said, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. If you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Right? I guess you get that, that, that 
sustainability is, is, a, is an important aspect of unity. And we will see a little more about that when we come to look at the advantages or the benefits of unity, right? There's sustainability in unity. And, and it takes you a lot further than if you try to go alone. When there is unity, things run smoothly and more gets accomplished. We agree with that. But where there is division, there is greater potential for chaos and confusion. And this came from Scotty Sellers from the Jefferson Church of God. Another quote here says, unity takes an intentional effort, an intentional behavior, an intentional desire to belong and function in the team. Very, very important. Listen to that again. Unity takes an intentional effort. So, so unity is not something that's just automatic. It is not something that just happens. It takes an intentional effort, intentional behavior. This is why we're going to be talking about the Christian character that is necessary for our unity. And it must be an intention in your heart to want to have and possess that character that you can have an intentional desire to belong and to function in the team. You must want to be part of the team. It must be your intention. And as much as we try to motivate people to be part of a unit, part of a body, function together, it, it has to be an intent of their heart. And, and sometimes that's where the problem comes and getting that intent. But of, of course, as we go along, we dialogue and we see what is necessary for, for creating um, that strong bond of unity. We will see how we can motivate people and how to make them have the intent in their heart. And some of these things are going to be very, very critical. Because so I, I really hope that you make sure you don't miss any of the sessions. Christian unity is more than just being together because we can be united in rebellion by like those who are building the Tower of Babel. I just made mention of that. So there can be a good cause and a bad cause to being united. So it's not just being together. Biblical unity must bring honor and glory to God by fulfilling his will for the church. And I just want to read you a little short passage here from Romans, which emphasizes that point. Romans chapter 15, 5 and 6. It says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to see, come up, very often as we look through the Bible and look at passages related to togetherness and Christian unity, they talk about being a one mind and speaking the same thing, right? Because we are glorifying God when we are united um, around the truth of God's word, united around God's perspective and God's position on issues and not what we feel or not what we think about an issue and what we might traditionally hold to. Um, we want to be focused on what the truth of God's word is. So we together with our mouth speak the same thing and in our mind work towards the harmony that is necessary for us to be able to function as a group. All right, I read one more section here and then I just pause if there are any comments that you want to make based on some of those things that, that have been said. And I want you to understand that we are going to spend a little time also further down in, in the dialogue, in the discussion, not tonight, but as part of the study to, to understand what the Bible means when it says to be of one mind and that we speak the same things. Okay? Because we have to be clear what that really means because sometimes we can misinterpret um, the intent of the word um, by statements that have been made. Is, are we asking that God thinks that we are to be clones? Um, that we all look at, behave the same way, that is something that we got to think about. So what unity is and what it is not is what is going to be focused. And we look at the first element here of what unity is not. So we have an idea there by those little quotes and those statements as to what unity involves and how it connects us. Unity is not uniformity. That's a statement made. 
do you hold fast to that? We can be unified or we can be united in diversity. I think that statement too, because I will pause for you to, to dialogue about that. Do you believe that? Do you hold fast to that? That unity is not uniformity. We can be united in diversity. So we don't have to address the same way that the Amish people look alike. We don't have to have, have our worship services being the same. We do not have to perhaps paint our churches in the same color. We can have diversity, but still be unified. You remember that there are a lot of things that used to unify us in terms of, of how we conduct ourselves and how we did things together. And, and that was a form of uniformity. But we can do a whole lot of things and not be unified. So we can be uniform and not be unified. And we can be diverse and yet be united. I sure you remember the times when all the ladies or, or the bulk of them were wear white to communion. You can remember the times when you could not go on the platform without a hat if you're leading worship. You can remember the times when we, we all felt a particular way about ladies wearing pants in church. Okay, so, so we were uniform in a sense and doing things in a particular way, but did that mean that we were united or that we were in unity, but have been uniform? Um, remember the times when our, all of our Friday services were three hours long. I remember the times when we did foot washing at the Good Friday service, and, and those are things that were common throughout the, um, the Church of God. But now there is some diversity and we don't do those things the same way. And, and we need not be too worried about diversity because God is the author of diversity. And when we look at Corinthians um, chapter 12, which we will examine in detail when we come into the Bible study section of a lot of these, these scripture references, we will see how diversity is an appointment of, of God and how it serves the purpose of still bringing the church together in oneness, right? So, for example, the scripture says that a husband and wife become one. They're united, but there's still diversity. There's still two different people all together coming together, but they form a oneness, and the Bible says the two shall become one. There are many instruments in the orchestra, but they harmonize to produce beautiful music. So, different instruments, they're not the same. you got the, the, um, the drums, you, you got the clarinet, you got the flute, you got the string instruments, and, and, and all of those can combine together, even though they are diverse type of instruments with different sounds, look different, but they combine together as one to form beautiful music and harmonize. Now, they can be discarded if they're not harmonizing well. But once you get those instruments harmonizing, you can produce some beautiful music which brings them together as one. All right. So I, I paused there for a minute or so. If you want to make any comments or ask any questions or make any input. And I want to do that all along so that you know we, we make sure that we get you engaged and we get you talking because, as I said, it's not a lecture. We are going to be in this together. And I believe there's a lot that we're going to share, a lot we're going to understand as, as we dialogue together. So feel free, please to, uh, free to do that and make life easier for me as well. So a little pause. If you, if you stay too long before I get any comments, um, I will proceed. Do you agree with the concept that unity is not uniformity, that we can be united in diversity? Hello, good night. <clears throat> yes, good night. Yes, I do. I do agree, yes, that uh, unity is not, is, is, not, is not uniformity. We can be diverse. And I, I, I go back to what you mentioned in uh, Corinthians, when Paul used the uh the, the human body to uh, to represent the church yes. when he speaks about the about the different uh, parts of the body I, as you would have mentioned the, the different parts of the body have a different function 
but they all right. have one purpose. But they all have one purpose, and that is to make sure the body function, the, the, the entire body function, the way it's supposed to. And that's the same way we believe in churches as well. We all unique, as you put it, God created us or, or unique in our own ways. And I believe that once we have the same purpose, and that is Jesus Christ serving God, that we our, our diversity can be used to, to I, I, our diversity can be can be used to unify us. That, in other words. So I do believe yes. I, I do agree with you. Very good. Very so in, in, in other words, um, the diversity can be celebrated. And we need, not, we need not think it is a problem when there is diversity because we can celebrate diversity and we can benefit from diversity in, in, in significant ways. We, we can conclude that. Agree, agree. All right, thank you. All right, and if there are any other perspectives on unity, remember these are some quotes, some of them I have put together, some of these have come from um, individuals that have researched, but of course you can have a statement of your own as how you think about unity that you can share with us. That is also welcome. So that we get a wider parameter and perspective on, on what we are dealing with. So feel free to make your own quote. Hi, good night. Good night. And it'd be good if you can give your name and the church you're from so we can get familiar with with individuals, because we are one family here. Oh my. <laughs> um, good night again, everyone. My name is Linnell. I'm from Princess Town Church of God. Okay. Um, Welcome. I'm glad oh, to have you. Thank you. Uh, while I agree that unity is not uniformity, and I absolutely mm -hmm. agree that we can be diverse. I think uniformity lends to a certain amount of order and structure, which also is needed in the church. All right, thank you very much for making that point. And my research indicated that there were some people of that opinion as well, that that uniformity lends to structure and, and, and sameness that could be important as, as you, you do things um, together and, and we, are, we are not throwing that out of the window completely, um, but we need to see what we can focus on that can be similar and make a significant difference or it can just be being uniform for the sake of uniformity that might not make a significant difference in how we honor God, God or how we defend the truth. See, so yes, that's important. And, and, and I believe that as we go along in the discussion, we can see areas in which we can be uniform that can strengthen our bond and strengthen our purpose. Because remember, we are, we are unified around a purpose. As Romans said, to bring glory to God and to bring truth to the world. And, and Jesus even said that when, when we are in oneness, we, we glorify the Father. And, and then through that one, is people recognize the purpose for which he came into the world. The, the significance of Christ into the world is reflected in how we are together as Christians. And yes, uniformity can, can bring harmony um, and it can establish structure as well. So I, I support that position. Good and it can bring some commonality and how we function that, that could make us stronger together. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Paul Osborne from the Church of God at Gardens. Um, uh, Welcome, glad to have you. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with our sister um, spoke about uniformity too. Um, I liked your um, illustration of an orchestra um, or different instruments um, mm -hmm. and, and go to a broader sense that there are different people, different um, types of people playing the instruments. Some, um, their ear, they like the violin, some ear, their ears like the saxophone, but they are brought together um, um, with the, with the common purpose, I agree with, with that too. They're given okay, common purpose, right? Yeah, they um, they're given music, and the music mm -hmm. uh, is written for the instrument. 
um, the type of instrument, but they're playing one tune, one one song, one one piece um, in harmony. And I think the word of God is given that is given us um, one song to sing. Um, Correct. Correct. According, according to the salvation, our salvation, and it's also the Lord of God has given us one director, um, uh, who is um, our Savior Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and King. So there, there is one, there is one that who we have to follow, and He's given us sheet music or the Word of God that we 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 ought to agree on. That's correct. Right, and and the sheet music basically is well it's written for different instruments, they have to be playing the same music. The melody basically is the same, yeah. which as you said, compared with the word of God. So we, yeah. we can't be saying different things because the word of God is the focus. That is the sheet music, that is the truth, that is which we are all going by, even though we have different instruments, different parts of the body, and different members having different offices, different gifts of the spirit. Yeah. But it's one focus on glorifying yeah. God through his truth, proclaiming mm. the truth of the gospel and bringing men and women to an understanding of, of that truth. So in other words, we, we can say that we exist to, to know the truth, which comes through the study of the word, to live the truth, which comes mm. by the character that we possess, which is that of Christ, and to proclaim the truth. That's, 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 so, so that's what brings us together. Right, knowing the truth, living the truth, and proclaiming the truth, and those are things that Jesus said. Mm -hmm. Right, go into all the world. You got to proclaim what you're able to live and what you know, and that and that's what unites us. Yeah, so we we are basically agreeing um, on on the same issues here. All right. Good night, Reverend Jamon. Peter yes. Good night to you. Yes, sir. How blessings on you. Thank you for all. Blessings on you too. Yes, I like the concept with the spoiling the lion. Though. That, that, that seems yeah. so impossible, but when you really think about it, uh, each of those little creatures have their mm -hmm. own strength. So I believe right. it would be possible to bring down a lion. <laughs> uh, I, I really like that concept. And in terms of the uniformity, mm -hmm. I guess that was a concept that came out years ago in churches in terms of like painting. Um, yes. and I guess that was like identifying, mm -hmm. well, this is the Wesleyan church. This is the New Testament church. Sure. So mm -hmm. I guess in a sense, you can, you can use that, although we don't want to dwell so much on that. But I guess that concept um, ha, ha, was, was, was years ago. Nowadays, now there's different colors to churches and so on and so forth. So I just said I wanted to make that statement because it came, it came to my mind. Yes, Pete, and, and you're correct. That was part of the cultural identity. I remember our churches were battleship gray. Church of God churches were painted in the battleship gray, which Brother Griffith felt very strongly. Um, uh, you know, he used to be saying we need to change that. Right, yeah, so that was the way of churches, you know, bring uniformity. But it, once we carry the same title on top of our churches, that is the uniformity there. You know, as we you say, we can have different colors. But that is something that we can debate because those are things that sometimes are suggested and we could dialogue about those. And when we come to the section which deals with um, the way forward, those are some of the things that, you know, we could dialogue about. But thank you, Brother Pete. Yes, Roseanne King from Jackson. I just want to add to all that has been said before and mm -hmm. point us to a picture of unity in Revelation seven nine to ten coming from the new international version where it says after this i looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from mm -hmm. every nation tribe yes. people and language standing before the throne and before the lamb they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, these people from every tribe, nation, people, and language, they cried out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's a, that's a great picture of unity. Yes, I, I rose, and it is also a great picture of the two things that were being discussed just now. There, were, there was diversity 
because they were from every different tribe and nation, but yet they were all wearing white and they all had palm, palm leaves. So, so in other words, there was some uniformity around them, but there was also diversity. So we can have both. That's and correct. More unique. Right. Thank you very much for that passage. Yes, good night. I'm calling. This is my name is Donville. I'm calling from Bermuda. And, yes, sir. Uh, I'm welcome. Yes, I'm, thank you. I'm joining here, and I see the key ingredient in our unity is if you look in the book of Colossians 3 14, and it states here that uh, beyond all these things, put on and wrap yourself in unselfish love, which is the mm -hmm. perfect bond of unity. So I believe yes. that uh, I, it, the key ingredient in that in the unity in the body of Christ is love. And we're Correct. talking about the unselfish love, you know. And so therefore, as we get into the unity, then we begin to see what is, um, begin to have to go into love. When we talk about the love in the body of Christ, what does it really represent, you know? Correct. Correct. And thank you very much for that. And, and that is going to come up when we look at the character, right? Because remember, that's one of the, the, the areas that we have to look at, the character that's necessary for our unity. And we look at specific okay. verses which speak about, about character um, attributes that are very essential to, to uniting us. And if, we, and if we don't have the manifestation of these, then we can have um, some serious issues. All right, let me make another statement here about what unity is not. So we say it is, it is not uniformity. While, while we agree that you can have some uniformity, unity is not uniformity because you can have uniformity and still not be united. And we can have diversity and still be united. Okay, so we, we have to have a clear understanding of that. We can be uniform, but not united. Dress the same way, look the same way, and, and, and do, do things in a similar pattern, but yet not have the, 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 the connection that we ought to have in spirit. But we can be diverse, different gifts, different backgrounds, different perspective, different um, character traits and, and things of that nature and, and, and yet be united um, in the spirit. Another statement here says, unity does not mean thinking the same way on all things. Listen to that carefully. Unity does not mean thinking the same way on all things. And I read a passage from, from, from Corinthians and see now if you will have a little variance with that statement. We can have different opinions and still be united, right? That is what that is saying. We can have different opinions and still be united. This is not to contradict what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.10, which is the verse that Rose um, gave to us when she was setting up the schedule for our prayer session. And Paul said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing. And I told you that we have to give some more in-depth discussion to that. I'm just mentioning it here now for, for your response. And that there be no divisions among you, none whatsoever, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now that's the King James Virgin. All right, so you need to think about that because the statement says we can have different opinions and still be united. How does that match with what Paul is saying? Are they contradicting? What the, um, the New Living Translation says and in relation to that verse is that the request is to live together in harmony and be united in thought and purpose. In thought and purpose. Not necessarily having the same opinion, but you can be still united in thought and purpose. In other words, you can agree to disagree and you can still harmonize and you can still be in union well, you might have a different opinion from somebody. Paul is not emphasizing perfect conformity, but unity. Disagreement does not have to lead to division. So in these statements carefully, he goes on to establish Christ as the standard and points out that they are to conform to Christ. And when they do that, they will come into alignment with each, with each other. This is why he went on to say, let us have the mind in Christ. So when he says that we have one mind, is that meaning that we have the same mind that we want to have with each other? Or is he saying that we all must have the mind of Christ? 
And that's what unites us. And when we have that same thought of mind, we think about things the way Christ thinks about them. We feel about things the way Christ feels about them. That then would allow us to be different in terms of an opinion, but yet we can still have unity in our purpose and our thought. He said unity must reach the level of cooperative thinking, cooperative thinking and judgment on matters of critical importance. All right, I pause there to, to, to let you comment on that. And then we will look at some more statements on unity. Good evening. Uh -huh. Good evening. I am, my name is June and I'm from Chelsea Church of God. And I'm, okay. while, we, um, while we're discussing, I'm thinking that the Bible tells us that God made us all for different purposes. Yes. I, I think sometimes when we are um, trying to look at unity, we are trying to bring everybody under the same purpose. But the strength, I think, that comes with different personalities and different people is that we can all see it from a different point of view and we can yes. get a complete picture rather Correct. than all of us looking at the same piece of the pie and missing all the others. Uh, so I think that good. unity encompasses different personalities and ideas. And that is the, and, and the interweaving of all the different personalities and ideas gives us the strength to move. Very correct. And when, and when we come to look at the first Corinthians 12 passage, you will get an understanding Yes, and even more detail of what you say, how true that is. That we have different offices, um, different gifts, um, different purposes, but they all have to combine for the perfecting of the saint and for the edifying of the body until we come in unity uh -huh. and in harmony with the will and character of Christ. So you are right. So, so you would agree then that we can um, have different opinions and still be united in purpose? We should have different opinions and we right. should we be should. able to we should and we should be able to look at everybody's opinion without being dogmatic about your own. Because right. when we do that, we learn from different angles how things can be handled better than maybe the way you are looking at it. I I don't think right. that we, we have to be a fusion to in order for us to function in a complete, you know, a complete uh, agreement. I just believe that the more different we are, the more we see things differently, the more we are able to understand and agree. And like you said, disagree sometimes, um, you know, respectfully, then we can grow. Correct. And I, and I, and I want us to pay attention to, um, Acts chapter 15, because that will come up very much in our discussion when we're looking at disagreement, because we're going to look at the Paul and Barnabas issue, all right? And we're going to look at some things that the church council met to discuss because there were disagreements. And disagreement does not necessarily mean we are to be disagreeable. And I agree wholeheartedly with what you said, that the expectation should be that we have different opinions. And sometimes we don't celebrate that enough, you know. We think that a different opinion is a cause for disunity or disruption. And that if somebody has a different opinion or a different um, persuasion or a different conviction on a particular issue that they are dividing the group. No, what, what you are rightfully saying is that it brings us in a position to examine things from different perspectives and then we get a better picture and then we can come to a consensus position on what we need to have. So for that, for your homework assignment, look at Acts chapter 15, because that is going to come up in our second um, study session. All right, any other comments before we proceed? Good night. Good night. This, Good is, night. Janice. this is Janice from Leadville, New Testament Church of God, formerly Church of God. Once All Church right. of God, always Church of God. All right. I just Once I joined the child of God, always the child of God. Always, always. I joined <laughs> at 8 30 because my church had our, our prayer fasting session for the next four days. But I was okay. invited by I was invited by San and John, my dear friends. And I want to say a good night to the 
Jackman family. They are also my good friends. It's good to see all you. Right. And thank you for being with the family connection again. God bless after you. all, after all, yes. God bless you too. Okay. Glad to have you. Thank you. All right, let me read just the remainder of the statements they have here. And it will give us some more that we can discuss up to then the, the nine o'clock position, because then we don't want to um, leave any material out that we have to pick up um, for the next study session, which is taking a look at what caused division in the church, how it started from oneness and how we got to where we are now in such a divided church, because these, this will help us understand what we need to avoid to repeat some of the same issues. Biblical unity is oneness of purpose consistent with the will of God. That is very clear that we understand that. If there are competing goals, there will be conflict. We can have different opinions, but the goals do, do not necessarily have to be competing. We can have different opinions, but we can come together and focus on the same goals, same objective, the same direction, and the same focus by consensus agreement. People can sit and having their own opinion but when we get together and we agree on a particular direction, that's harmony. That's focusing on a particular purpose and we can be united around that. If God is not in the equation, then unity is trouble, is in trouble. It truly must be about his will and his work, not his endorsement for our work and our will. These are statements I'm reading. Now, that, that's not original. That's not mine. That's a, that's a quote that I saw. But I thought it noteworthy to note that because I think, you know, it could give us some good understanding. It must be about his will and his work. So watch again, the focus is always being united around God's truth, God's purpose, God's perspective, God's will. Because when we look at how the church fell, we see how human opinions and human ideologies and human uh, interpretations created problems for the church. So we got to be focused on on. God's perspective and his will and his work, not his endorsement for our will and our work. It's not what we want to do and get God's sanction on it. It's doing what God wants us to do. Next statement here. God's truth is the absolute standard by which reality is measured. Not our own feelings, cognitive instincts, or moral position. It's the truth of God is the absolute for reality. We measure reality in the way that God sees it. Because our world is creating their own realities. That's why the gay will say that they can be Christian and still gay. They have their own reality that they're creating, but is that the will and purpose of God? What God has said on the subject and what he wants us to do on the subject is the critical issue here. If this is not the first question we are asking, then unity is in trouble. Listen to that again. What has God said on the subject? And what does God want us to do on the subject? If these are not the first questions that we are asking, then unity is in trouble. Because then we will lose focus on God's position and God's perspective, and we end up going down the road of our own agenda. The early church in Jerusalem thrived because it was unified. That's the Acts 2 and Acts 4 that we will look at. The phase having favor with all the people refers to those on the outside looking at the church on the inside. They saw a selfless and unified church and were attracted to it. And we come to look at the benefits of or the importance of unity. That is saying here in this statement that unity attracts people when they see it. And that's why Jesus was so concerned about unity. All right, three more statements to be read and then we have 15 minutes to talk and to dialogue before we close off the session. Each person in the church is like a cell and their relationship with Christ must be healthy for the whole body to be healthy. You have cells in your body and if a cell is out of disorder, you can get some cancer coming in. You can get issues. The cells must be healthy and functioning well for that body. Same thing with the body of Christ. A church whose common goal is Christ will have a better chance at unity than a community whose goal is unity. See, so it's not unity for unity's sake. It's not just coming together on a project or coming together 
on 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 a particular you know point or position that we we might want to to, to have commonality on. It is about Christ, and the focus must be we go back to His will and His work, and not just for unity's sake. So we are not uniform for unity's sake. The common goal is about Christ and how this brings glory and honor to Christ. Divisions within the church destroy much of the fellowship, love, prayer, evangelism, strength, and support that Christians in any location ought to enjoy. So that divisions within the church. And remember, we can disagree without being divided. We can have different opinions without being divided. Divided is when we split up and we want to go our different ways because we can't harmonize and we have issues and working together as a team. That is what destroys the fellowship, love, prayer, evangelism, strength, and support that Christians in any location ought to enjoy. Final one, God deserves partnership, not independence. It's not you in your own corner and I in mine. God deserves partnership, not independence. God deserves engagement, not isolation. You know, your whole corner of my mind again. And God deserves cooperation, not competition. All right, those are the end of the statements about unity that helps us to um, understand um, what we're talking about. Okay, I, I read, I read, I, I forgot this one. Unity among Christians disintegrates when we place more importance on who gets recognition, how we interpret scripture, or how we organize the church that on the demonstration of love and oneness. And this is what my brother from Gardens earlier was talking about, the love. Unity among Christians disintegrates when we place more importance. Now, it's not saying that we are not to place importance on recognition and interpretation of scripture or how we organize the church. It is saying when we place more importance on those things than on the demonstration of love and oneness. Oneness. So even if we, if we disagree on an interpretation of scripture or in a particular position we have, the important thing is that love and oneness can still connect us. There is a false idea that we have to agree on every minute detail theologically to have communion. This can be a hindrance to unity. There's a false idea that we have to agree on every minute detail theologically to have communion. This can be a hindrance to you. You know, that's not mine. That's another statement that I have put here so that you can, um, you know, respond to it. All right. So we have 10 minutes now to, to talk now about some of those things that we have mentioned here and, you know, give your perspective on these things. And I hope we're getting a clear picture of unity and what it really means and what it's all about. The early church in Jerusalem thrived because it was unified. You believe that? You have evidence to that? Yes, that was demonstrated at Pentecost. Yeah, at chapter 2. Mm-hmm. How do you think they were unified specifically? <laughs> you know, the scripture said they had all things in common. Yes, they had all things in common. It, it, uh, 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 and how was that manifested practically? They sold their possessions. Yes, yes, go ahead. And they brought everything to the disciples to distribute to each other as everybody had need. Good. Very good. That's a practical demonstration of, of oneness. What else did they do? 
Charles and gave Steve. themselves to prayer and to the apostles' doctrine. And watch that key phrase there. They gave themselves. Nobody was forcing these people. We see, we said earlier uh, that unity must be intentional. That, that indicates an intent there. They gave themselves to the apostles' doctrine. They were serious about Bible study and the word. They were serious about looking after one another's needs. They were serious about prayer. They gave themselves to these things. And folks, we have to give ourselves to these same things to get the unity that will propel us, that will propel the church. Good night, Reverend John, man. Yes. Good night to you. Indeed. Now, I smile. I smile when you ask that question. And I want to take you back. Which one? Which uh, question? Which how, one? How, how the evidence of how the apostles were unified. Really? Yes. No, okay. But, but before we before we got get there, mm -hmm. you know there was a there was a time. Would you say there was a time before the upper room experience that they were not unified? Do you want me to say I'm, if that is the case? And I'm asking I, I, that, I, be, I believe I believe that that might have been the possibility. We didn't have a specific indication of it, like we have the specific indication of how they got unified. But but again, I, I didn't mention it tonight, but that would probably come in the discussion. Unity is about the spirit, right? Because when we come to look at what Bible says about unity, we will realize that we, we don't create unity, you know. God has created unity, and it's the Holy Spirit that brings us together, and it's all about the unity that we have in the spirit. We are to endeavor to keep the unity. Right, we, we, we are to endeavor to keep it. It has already been created by Christ and by the Holy Spirit. You will see that when we come to look at the word. But right, Randy, so there's a possibility that there was division among them and they um, came yes, together so, in the upper room and they were united in the spirit. Right. Okay, that, right. I, I will wait till you go on mm -hmm. in the next session with that. Okay, all right. Um, Reverend Jackman, Peter Earl again. Yes, just want to share. Just want to share a thought on the, mm -hmm. ver the verse from First um, Corinthians chapter ten. Right. Um, all all say the same thing. Person said Paul means that the Corinthian believers should all agree on how the Spirit works among them, and mm -hmm. the type of values that Christ would have them to hold. Yes. yes. Just thought so, it was so in other words, it, in other words, his focus is still around Christ. Yeah, he, he's that's his central. That's his central. That, that is the central thing he, here, right? So speaking that, the that, same that. thing is about yeah. his values. Yes, yes, and the, yeah, yeah, and the, and the Christian perspectives. That's what they say together, and that's why it's important that we come together and study that we can then say the same thing because we know what's what's God's perspective on it. What's what's the um, the, the, the Christian uh, way of, of seeing this particular issue that we can then say the same thing and, and while we might have disagreements on it and we were speaking different things when we study the word together and we get insight through the spirit is then we can say the same thing with clarity and, and if the church had been like that and continued well it was like that at a point if they had continued to be like that all of these divisions that we have now and these denominations that we have in the church will not have existed. But people got opinionated, holding on to their opinions and not looking at the Christ perspective or the God perspective on the issue. And we will see that when we come to look at divisions. So that's why Jehovah's Witnesses still hold on to their belief that Jesus is not God and the Mormons too. Because again, if even though it was taught by the apostles, of, of the, the deity of Christ, they still went along with a particular view that was expressed by a Gnostic um, teaching and it still exists today in their church. So it's important that we get to the truth and we speak then the same thing. So thank you for that, Pete. Yes, please. 
can can this story of how the ants are, you know, I know I'm taking it out of context. Then Proverbs said, go to the ant, those sluggard, consider her ways and words. I'm lifting that out of the context to ask you, can we learn unity from how we see the ant operates? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And those ants have different roles. But they work together. And there's a force. So, so yes, Randy, we can learn unity from the ant. Of how they work together and combine their efforts. And get the job done. This is, this is June again from Chelsea Church of God. And I think that is a very significant point. Because the thing is that we are working and not everyone is at the same level. And Correct. Every, but everyone can put a little piece into it to help to build it up. I mean, if you're building a house, you don't have all carpenters, you don't have all masons, you don't have all plumbers. Everybody, no matter how intelligent or how rich or how poor or how whatever, we are first of all children of God and we have different levels. My thing is that, you know, one of the things that I hold on to is that God made us all for different purposes. And if your purpose, if he's sending you to me with the dialogue of how you see it, then he wants me to look at it from that angle and, you know, and see how we're going to bring this thing together. Uh, I just, I just, you know, I have a strong feeling about unity. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and you are very, very right. We don't all have to be university graduates. We don't all have to be doctors. We don't all have to have the same office, the same ability, the same skill. But God can combine us and make us powerful, make us one and accomplish his purpose and his will for us. That's what exactly. he's about. The disciples were different, different temperament, different personality, different occupations, but they combined to be a powerful group. Yep. And, and Jesus was 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 the was the UD. What united the person who united them, who taught them. Yes. And that's what we must understand. So we can celebrate our differences. We can celebrate the different levels and not despise anybody or look down on anybody or prefer other people or, or esteem others higher than, 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 than others and things of that. So when we come to look at the character that's necessary for unity. Those are some of the things that we, we have to really closely examine. And the Bible speaks precisely to those things. One minute to nine o'clock. So who is going to take that last minute? Are we Good going to night. take that to wrap up? Good night. Good night. Good night. You're in, so you take that minute. To have all the education, the knowledge, everything for unity. Mm -hmm. What distracts us most is that we are not mature. Mm -hmm. Because having all the knowledge, all the information, and we act childish, it brings that disharmony. So I believe we have to have that level of maturity as believers in order for unity to really work. All right, thank you. And, and that is going to be connected when we, when we get to the part. Um, because a lot of what we're discussing is going to be interconnected. And you're going to find that we might say some things, repeat some things, or we might go to certain scriptures that we might have seen already. But you can be making a different point, a different contribution from the same scripture. So that is what is going to happen as we go through the study. You will see that we've made references um, that are similar. But you have made a point that is significant connected to the character, maturity, it's part of the essence of Christian character that we are going to mature. And the, and the Bible also mentions that, that, that God has given us prophets and teachers and, and, and evangelists, and, and the, he's going to combine these efforts and these skills to bring us to maturity, to bring us to maturity, because that's the aim, that's the purpose, that we mature in Christ, we become more Christ-like. That's why you go back to the objective that I read at the beginning, that we become more unified, more Christ-like, more spirit-directed, that is maturity. And when we get there, that is when our, our, our church will propel itself 
really far in significant ways and accomplish um, our goals and our mission, and we can do it together. So I really want to thank you uh, all so much for contributing tonight. I think we are off to a good start. And as we go forward, we're going to even get more dialogue. This was just laying the foundation and establishing the groundwork, but we got some interesting areas to discuss that they're going to come up. And especially, as I said, I think we're going to get a lot of debate on James 15 with that Paul and Barnabas. Well, here was Paul saying the Corinthians, don't be divided. And yet we see some division between he and Barnabas. Was that division um, separation? Were there still a harmony and unity? Was it just a matter of difference of opinion and perspective? Those are things that we will talk about. How do we view those two mature men? And they were mature um, sister that just spoke to us. They were mature leaders, Paul and Barnabas, but they had the differences. But we will see the outcome of all of that. And we will learn how we can have different positions and still be one. So we are, we, we are joining ourselves together in prayer. That's something that unites us. Remember the early church were united in prayer. And Sister Rose has identified um, some of the areas that we're going to be praying on. I believe that many of us would have prayed and fasted the day, fasted day at different times for different periods. So we didn't have to be uniform in that. We might have been diverse. Some of us might have done a Daniel fast. Some of us might have fasted for 24 hours. Some of the fast for 12 or whatnot, but we were united in prayer today. That's important. And fasting, we do that tomorrow and Friday, continue to do it. This is the way that we are connecting. And this is the way that is going to be very powerful um, in you defend us. So thank you very much for being with us tonight and looking forward to having you the other six um, sessions to come. I believe that the Lord is going to do something really significant and wonderful in us as we share together and we have a better understanding of how we are to function as a community of believers. That's who we are. We are a community of believers. We call ourselves the Church of God Reformation Movement, but we are just a, a, a community and, and we are part of a bigger group. But we have to work together to establish our own harmony, our own oneness, our own togetherness, that then we can be connected in a larger way to the, um, the bigger body, but we must get it right among ourselves. So God bless you. Thank you very much for being here. So